So, okay. Dr. Maybe I should just write some title. So, in the last talk in Matthew Morrow's lecture series on P. IDK Talmud Table Cromology. There we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi again. Thanks for coming back. Uh, so this is part three of Piatica Tamotivic Cohomology. Let me start with a recap of where we are. Uh, firstly, so I have forgot to send the, the notes for Wednesday's talk, but they should be up this afternoon, along with the notes for this talk. So as I said, let's start with a quick recap of, of what we did last time. So um, we claimed that this sort of symptomic cohomology, what we call the ZP, sort of weight J symptomic cohomology, defined as the quasi-symptomic cohomology with coefficients, oops, sorry, with coefficients in the K2J sheaf uh, was good theory whatever exactly that means, of weight j piadic et al motivic cohomology. And then for, in the case of FP algebras, we kind of sketched a proof of one of the key properties uh, which you could call the filtration theorem stating that this does indeed correspond to a filtration and a Tia Hertzberg book style filtration on the Piadic et al. K theory of A. So we've got some complete filtration on the piadic et K theory with graded pieces given by the usual atia hertzberg book style shifts um, of this theory. And therefore we get in particular an atia hertzberg book spectral sequence Coming from, so let me check my indexing. So my E2 page is the H I minus J of this theory. It's the Z P J. Ah, oh, no, I'm going to put my things in negative degree now. I'll tell you that's why I've decided to flip it. So this is my weight minus J degree I minus J motivic cohomology. And this will be converging to k minus high minus j of a. Uh, I picked this indexing in the hope that there would be no complaints about it. And I thought I would draw this for you. If at some point today I want to draw this for you and I tell you more how it looks. So I might as well start by doing that now. So let's have a picture. So just to keep things clear, so my A, this is um, quasi symptomic FP algebra, and I'm going to write just as a piece of shorthand, I'll write HI weight J uh, to mean the HI well, weight J motivic cohomology. But if I keep having to write all these ZPs and As, then the spectral sequence will be a disaster. So HIJ is shorthand for uh, degree I weight J motivic cohomology. So then I've got, let's see, most of the fun is going to happen in the third quadrant. So I've got an H0 weight zero. Then I have my H1 weight one. I've got my Milner line going down this axis. H2 weight two. 
so on and so forth. I might have an H0, excuse me, that should already be an H. This has been H1 weight zeroed. I could have an H1 weight zero. I could have an H2 weight one an H3 weight two, but then one knows that there's nothing beyond that. And then off in the other direction, there I won't have anything, there I won't have anything, there I could have an H1 weight two, I could have global sections of a weight two, and then there I would have an H2 weight three, I'd have an H1 weight three, I'd have global sections in weight three, those will be zeros. Maybe I should have done my zeros in a different color. Tell you what, let me do the zeros in a different color and then they'll be easy, easy to ignore, which is what we should all do with zero. So make them a little bit gray instead. There's zero, there's zero, zero, zero. Zeros off ever for there, zero, zero. Those will continue, these will be zeros there. So the real fun is taking place sort of off in this direction. Uh, this is the I axis. That's the J axis going up and my arrows are going, uh, oh, there's not a single non-zero arrow at the moment. I should add an H three, wait three, and then I can at least draw one arrow like this. And the next arrow will be going like that to my H four, wait three. And how are things adding up? So, Yeah, I'm kind of confused by this H2 weight one. Sorry, I'm confused by something here. Ah, no, no, that seems okay. In the local case, that would disappear. That'd be okay. That's okay. That's the, that's the tab obstruction term. Okay. Sorry, I'm kind of talking to myself there to do this. There's some stuff adding up. There's the next bit adding up. There's the next bit adding up. Uh, let me come and tell you what these different bits are. So that's the stuff adding up to K2 et al. That's the stuff adding up to K1 et al. That's the stuff adding up to K0 et al. Okay, and then I guess this little piece in here is it's going to be the K minus one et al, which is all there is the K minus one. Any questions? Why don't we have terms like H31? Okay, so that's a great question. So if you were doing something like a tau motivic cohomology, sorry, l adic motivic cohomology, you could, because the l adic a tau cohomological dimension of a scheme can be very big. But the phenomenon that one is witnessing here is the fact that in characteristic P, the piadic et tau cohomological dimension of an affine scheme is one. And so from a K-theoretic point of view, what that means is when you pass from K-theory to its et sheepification, information only spreads out a little bit. And it's that information that you see in the final column, and it then doesn't spread out any further. Sorry, but how far does it spread? Any? It spreads out where I... Sorry? It spreads out where I've put it. Ah, uh, uh, restricted by what you have written. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I see. I see. So the zeros really do start once you're, I mean, I'm going I'm to write these sorts of vanishing statements down in a moment, but that really is the final column on the right hand side. Is there a comparison map to from the usual um, 
<clears throat> spectral sequence for ordinary K theory to this? So ordinary, uh, you mean for non et al? Yes. So I'm gonna be, I'll be, I'm gonna be answering all these questions in a moment. Uh, so let me let me start answering them right now. If okay, so some properties. I want to tell you various oh, the, things about this. So I go that's, ahead. There's a question in the chat: Are the differentials related to Steno's operations? Oh, uh, I don't know. So not a satisfactory answer, but that's it's an honest answer. I don't know. So let me give you some some properties. So some so uh, some descriptions of some terms actually. So what can we say about some of these terms? So the H I J term, okay, there's gonna be various cases. We'll see how much I can say. Uh, so firstly, let me get my list in front of me and then I won't miss anything. Okay, so as already indicated in the diagram, these are zero uh, if I is strictly bigger than J plus one. That, as I say, is secretly due to some reason that Piatic of tower cohomological dimension on characteristic P schemes, on characteristic P affine schemes, is just one. Uh, but since all these things that we've seen are, are vaguely controlled by some invariance coming from derived Durham cohomology, you can also show that there's zero, that the HI weight J will be zero if omega one of A on FP can be generated by strictly fewer than i minus one terms. Uh, so the thing will even start, what I want to say, you'll be able to draw a, a whole half plane such that it vanishes to the right as soon as you have a vanishing bound on, on omega. Um, if i is equal to j, so if i is equal to j plus one, so that's this whole column here. We also have a description. So let me write it, uh, let me write it down and then I'll, I'll come back to it. It's inverse limit over R of new R tilde weight J of A. And I'll define this for you in a moment. Uh, if I is equal to J, so that's this, the Milnor line that I've put here, I get the periodically completed Milnor K groups of A. Uh, I'd better assume that A is local for that. Otherwise, otherwise I don't know. Uh, and then it's zero if, what can I say? So it's zero if I is strictly less than J and A is regular Noetherian. That's just by some comparison term to classical piadic etal motivic cohomology. Uh, more generally, this is true if A is, is what Shane Kelly and I called Cartier smooth, which is somehow enough to control some properties of the cotangent complex and get the same range of vanishing. Like if you stick in a valuation ring of characteristic P, you can, you can prove the same range of vanishing. Um, it's zero if I is strictly less than, than zero. So that's a kind of valence and Lichtenbaum vanishing statement. But there, there's nothing to prove because of how we've chosen to define it. And it, otherwise it's kind of mysterious. And I don't have any other general descriptions of the terms. So I, th I thought the axes were I and J. Uh, I hope they are. So then I equals J and I equals J plus one don't look like columns to me. Ah, oh, sorry, like sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, okay, it's, what do I wanna say? Uh, 
Uh, right. Wait, what's the problem then? Uh, have I misindexed something? Maybe you are just no. like E2 page and not the, because HIJ is not E2IJ. HIE, right, HIJ is not E2IJ. That's the, that's the problem. HIJ is not E2IJ. There's this, I think this, this answers Kirsten's question. I mean, this, right, this, this IJ is, not, here I've got, so I've got the standard sort of a tier Hertzberg twist in the indexing, uh, which throws off. Uh, so maybe I should just delete these little comments. If I delete that, then there's nothing, but I think there's no mathematical problem. I think there's not, even, there's not even an indexing problem, is there? Thanks. Right, you're right. I mean, it's terrible. I had to, I had to draw this spectral sequence maybe five times before I was convinced it was actually okay. Um, okay, so I wanted to then describe some of, some of these terms. So here, what's this new R tilde, which appears in this single column of the fourth quadrant? Uh, so this new R tilde J, of A is the mod P to the R weight J Artin Schreier obstruction. So for example, I just give it to you when R is equal to one. And for the general formula, you just replace all the Duram, all the Duram groups by some Duram width groups. I look at differential forms of A over FP. Oops, sorry, this should be weight J differential forms. I take weight J differential forms of A over FP. I mod it out by the D omega J minus one. And I have a standard map, which is Cartier inverse minus one. Uh, so for example, in the weight J case, I would just get a modulo the group a to the p minus a so in general i mean this i mean this is some term measuring the difference in fact between zariski and a tau theories which is, I mean, it, somehow it, it appears in, implicitly or otherwise uh, in high dimensional class field theory. Uh, I guess it's even sort of implicitly in the Tate conjecture because that's measuring the difference between uh, Zariski and the motivic cohomologies uh, in the, the Cato conjecture on the cohomology of smooth projective varieties over finite fields. So I just informally call it a sort of art and shrive obstruction term. It's therefore unsurprisingly related to, uh, to these conjectures. So that, as I say, is exactly what we see in this, this single column in the, in the fourth quadrant. And to answer Chuck's question, uh, maybe I should state this as a, as a theorem. So if A is local and we remove the, we remove this column. Uh, so we remove the column containing the H J plus one J's. The remainder is a spectral sequence converging to the connective piadic et al k theory of it. Uh, 
so that might look totally bizarre. The, some of, one of the results underlying that is that there's in fact, there's always a short exact sequence. It's even split between the usual K theory of A, the Ital K theory of A, and this group that I stuck at the end, uh, where I've now got to compute the weight. Ooh. I guess that weight should be plus one. Is that the K minus one two? Right. And so there I get N plus one. one. N. Sorry? Yeah, uh, and uh, I thought n plus one n. Okay, n plus. No, two. I think that's I think that's all right. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean that's the that's the inverse limit of the new R tildes in weight n plus one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the obstruction term will be a weight n plus one. Uh, it seems to make sense. I mean, if you come back uh, here and you look at what's going on for k minus one. Yeah, the tau k minus one is given by a weight zero Martin Shrive obstruction, which is indeed exactly what you'd expect because k minus one a tau will just be related to the first tau cohomology group with coefficients in the constant sheaf. And that should be exactly this Martin Shrive obstruction of weight zero. Uh, and okay, also, I mean, like usual in these, in these motivic spectral sequences, if I work rationally, then everything's zero. So maybe I can state that as a second part of a theorem, but that's pretty easy to prove. So the first theorem is that, and the second theorem is um, spectral sequence degenerates rationally. Oh, that's, uh, you don't even need Adam's operators. You just look at how the Frobenius is behaving on everything. We replace Adam's operator by Frobenius in these characteristic P situations. So it's a, it's a very general, uh, let's say a Tia Hertzberg uh, style motivic spectral sequence describing the, the tau K theory of an arbitrary quasi syntonic FP algebra. Uh, or even of any, or even the, the, the usual periodic K theory, as long as they're local. And why not have an example? So I thought about doing the cusp as well. Let me start with let me start with a favorite example for, for calculations of, of K groups. Let's take A to be a truncated polynomial ring. So we take K of X mod X to the M, uh, where K is some perfect field of characteristic P. I could actually take any perfect ring of characteristic P. The, the calculation worked the same way. Um, so then the general bounds that I stated above Tell us that the the weight r uh, the the degree i weight j cohomology will be zero unless the degrees are between zero and two. That's coming from the fact that the that the omega one of this ring is just generated by one element. Uh, a little bit more work. And you can check that the H zero and the H two are actually both also zero. Uh, for the H two, you use some trick that this is a graded ring. Um, so let's recall that this 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 ZPJ cohomology it's, it was ultimately defined as Frobenius invariance on something. Um, in the approach we took here, we did this quasi syntonic descent and we saw the Frobenius invariance inside some crystalline period rings. But in general, can I uh, uh, ask a question? Please. Uh, for example, H upper I of J, is it zero for I strictly smaller than J? 
strictly smaller than uh, uh, if i sorry is uh, uh, less or equal than zero sorry yeah that's this balance and so are you asking uh... yeah above uh, I can't... <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're asking this are you ah uh, i have missed sorry okay no okay because in fact so, so in fact I, I i make a point that you can extend this whole theory i mean as i stated the theorems in the first talk you can define this invariant for any FP algebra, in fact. So far, we've only done quasi-syntomic FP algebras, but you can do any FP algebra. And in that case, this would fail. So in, in, for general FP algebra, this Bredens and Lichterbaum vanishing would fail. But in the quasi-syntomic case, it holds. Uh, so as I said, with the, what was I saying? I was just wanted to make a comment on these on these vanishing statements. So our ring A in this case is graded, and you understand how the Frobenius respects the grading, and you can exploit that to show that the H two is zero, and then to show that the H zero vanishes, you do the following. So this ring, it differs from K by a nilpotent amount. And you can show that therefore that the difference in the motivic cohomologies uh, is all going to be P power torsion. So again, unsurprisingly, since it's supposed to describe the K theory, which is all P power torsion. But you can also check that the H is zero is gonna be P torsion free. In fact, we defined it as the, as the global sections of a P torsion free sheet. So the H0 is both P torsion free and P power torsion. So it vanishes too. And so the conclusion of all that uh, is that... Uh, sorry, I suspect that, uh, for example, HI of J with I strictly smaller than J should not only be P torsion free, but uh, P uniquely divisible. No. No, no. They're, going to, they're, going to, they're going to be bounded P power torsion groups. Because in fact, they're going to give us exactly the K groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're going to compute for us that the K group of K of X uh, mod X to the M. In fact, instead of periodically completing this, I could work with the relative K group because they're basically the, they're basically the same. And it will compute this for me uh, in fact, usually there'll be zero, and in odd degree, I'll get the H, the degree one weight n plus one over two. So this group, I mean, it, it can't be uh, like a uniquely p divisible group. It really is some bounded, some bounded group of p power exponent. So I wanted to present that because it gives you, uh, I mean, it gives you a motivic calculation of, of k theory of truncated polynomial algebras. I have a calculation for the cusp too, but I think maybe I exclude it because I'm not 100% sure it's right. I did it very late last night. Uh, so what I'm about an algebraically closed field of characteristic p? Uh, but, sorry, what do you want me to compute? Do you want me to compute the KN of the field itself? <clears throat> I just, is this related to Susan's calculation? Well, we, basically all this theory takes as, okay, no, because, so the, the easy answer is no, because Susan's calculation is about what happens away from the characteristic. Yes, but for an algebraically closed field of characteristic P, I mean, a, a finite field, the algebraic closure of a finite field, we do know that. No right, right, but I'm saying periodically there's nothing. Periodically it vanishes. And it's, it's classical that for any perfect field, it's K theory vanishes periodically. So there's some of, there's nothing, there's nothing new to say in that case. 
everything's zero. And all these motivic cohomologies will just be zero if you plug in a, a perfect field of characteristic P, except for the H zero, weight zero. And that will just give you a copy of ZP, but everything else will just be zero. Classically means two to who? Uh, Kratzner, Krasner, I want to say. Uh, does that sound? I'm trying to check. Yes, I think that's in Kratzner's Kratz paper on lambda structures on algebraic K theory. Uh, because he computes, what do you want to do? You just want to do the following. You check that the, 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 the action on the K groups induced by the Frobenius on the ring is multiplication by a power of P. And so then whenever the Frobenius is an automorphism of your ring, it tells you that your K groups are uniquely P divisible. And so after P completion, they will vanish. Thank you. And that's used as, I mean, that's used throughout this story, actually. I mean, it's sort of taken as a basic input to doing a lot of this. We don't, we don't try to reprove those sorts of statements. Indeed, I even wanted to say that this, this calculation of, of, in the non-perfect case, this, the calculation of Geiser and Levine of the piadic K groups of non-perfect fields of characteristic P, which goes through calculations of block cycles com complex and characteristic P, that's used as a crucial input. Uh, you can hide it, but even the abstract results that we have in topological cyclic homology, they, they, at some fundamental moment, they always require this, this, this input. Okay, so I think maybe I leave the examples there. Uh, maybe two would be, if we had more time, we could try to do... Uh, Maybe I can just say sort of similar, having not quite checked everything for, you could take something like Z mod P to the M instead. So in that case, we haven't actually defined it because I focused on FP algebras last time, but once someone has the general theory defined for all quasi-syntomic rings, you can play a similar game and write down a description of algebraic K groups in terms of these, these in terms of this motivic cohomology. Um, so what can we say now? There are some like, two routes we could we could take now, depending, in fact, on on what people are interested in. At some point, I was hoping to say a word about the mixed characteristic story, but I could also explain. I could also sort of revisit this story in characteristic P, and give you a a new definition that avoids all the quasi-syntonic machinery and which works for any FP algebra, though it's, oh, no, you, you, you need these two approaches. You need both the quasi-syntonic one and the, and the general one to prove anything. Maybe I even have time to, maybe I have time to do both. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, people want to vote in the chat whether they want to see, uh, mixed characteristic stuff or more characteristic P stuff. <laughs> or maybe you put your hand up if you want to see one and you do a smiley emoji if you want to see the other. So far there's only one vote. That's, <laughs> that's how democracy works these days. Okay, there's four votes. Okay, right. Oh, five. Wow. Mixed it is. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The lead the leaders have now spoken as well. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, can I really trust this voting system? It might be rigged. Okay. So we'll do some mixed characteristic. Um let me let me start with a reminder so 
So it's a mixed characteristic. And the prismatic stuff. I think maybe though I should give you a quick reminder of how the, what the main ideas of the proof were in characteristic P. Um, so let's recall the main steps in characteristic P. Uh, so there was the key, there was this key local theorem at some point. Uh, we described the chaotically completed K groups of all quasi regular. Semi, okay, the quasi regular semi perfectoids of characteristic P. So we call these quasi regular semi perfects S. So these are our QRSP sub FP uh, in terms of the associated crystalline period. So more precisely, they were given by some Frobenius eigenspaces inside these big crystalline period rings. And then the second thing was that we had to analyze this, uh, but I mean, this, yeah, the crystalline period ring, we had some filtered step inside it, we had our uh, divided Frobenius operator, and we analyzed this further, except we didn't really uh, sort of omitted this step using derived Duram technique coming from derived Duram cohomology. I mean, we needed to show that this gave us a sheaf with no vanishing, with no higher cohomology on the quasi regular semi perfects, because then we could apply some check descent arguments. This was the third step. So, and how did we prove these sorts of sheaf and, and acyclicity statements? We described a Chris as being filtered by various exterior powers of the co-normal module associated to S. And all these descriptions, they, they, they come from derived around cohomology. And that let us then apply these, these check descent arguments to conclude the filtration uh, by check descent for some cover. And so I can maybe just some, make some very short, no, I won't, let me, let, me, let me forget about any side comments and just people have voted. So I will just get straight into the mixed characteristic stuff. So for the general case, so these were the main steps of the proof to construct the filtration, but they're also most of the input into these sorts of results we saw earlier today, giving explicit bounds and describing some particular parts of the motivic cohomology, because they relate the invariant to derived Duram cohomology and derived crystalline cohomology, where you can really start to calculate some things. Um, so same strategy works in mixed characteristic. with replacements okay what do we got to change some things we've got to change uh, so the most important one is that this crystalline period ring needs to be replaced by a prismatic analog and then in the second step you've got to analyze what comes out so all the derived Duram cohomology, you guessed it, you've got to replace it by some steps in derived prismatic cohomology. Uh, I mean, this is what really was done. I mean, in the language of uh, topological periodic cyclic homology, topological cyclic homology, and so on in, in BMS2 but which you can now really reformulate uh, 
prismatically. So I, I'd rather adopt I'd rather adopt that approach. And for the third step, I mean, there's all this check descent argument. It just it just still works again. So basically, no change. So I need to give you a very, very brief recollection of some prismatic stuff, though I suspect many people have seen it. So a prism let's say B comma J is a, so it's a ring B plus an ideal Okay, it's a ring, so I should already tell you. I mean, it's a ring B, which already has more data. A prism is really a triple. It's a ring B uh, equipped with a derived Frobenius lift. So that is to say it's some map from B to B, which fits into a commutative diagram like so. where the map on the bottom is just the, the usual Frobenius for uh, the usual Frobenius on, on characteristic P. Uh, it's not a ring anymore. It's a possibly simplicial ring, but one still has the Frobenius. Or uh, it's, this is the same as what's called a, a delta structure. What's it called delta structure, delta map? Uh, I forget the terminology now. Delta structure. No, it's called a delta. I don't know. Um, so, but in particular, if you're P torsion free, then at the bottom of this diagram, we really just have B mod P. And so it's just a Frobenius lift in the usual sense. Uh, and an ideal J such that we have some compatibility conditions because we've got a sort of technicality completeness that B is derived p comma j adequately complete secondly in fact you need to impose some reasonable condition on j for this condition to even behave well so j is locally generated by single non-zero divisor as you say it's a cartier ideal and then this is some other key uh, geometric condition that the ideal generated by J and its image under the Frobenius has got to contain P. So the punchline, if you haven't seen these before, is it's a, uh, it's a one parameter deformation of B mod J which is equipped to the Frobenius. That's the, that's the punchline. So I don't have time to develop any of the, the theory of prisms or prismatic cohomology, but this definition is all you need to state the, the main calculation. So we have the following theorem, which is really, it's assembling multiple, it's assembling multiple statements from, from the PRISMS paper and from BMS2 and from the CMM rigidity paper. But let me, let me throw it all in, all into one. So suppose that I take some quasi regular semi perfectoid ring. then what is actually the absolute prismatic site of S, but in fact, we don't care about the site structure. So I just care about the category, uh, which consists of the following. I look at all prisms BJ uh, 
such that B mod J is equipped with the structure of an S algebra. So I just look the category of all these prisms. And then as I say, once you appropriately, but you don't even need to apologize it, this, this, uh, this forms for you the so-called absolute prismatic site of S. Indeed, this definition makes sense for basically for any ring S, but in the particular case of a, of a quasi-regular semi-perfectoid, you can prove the following. So this category has an initial object. So it's a universal prism, which is associated to the quasi-regular semi-perfectoid. And the ideal, so in generally in the definition of a, of a prism, you ask that your ideal be locally generated by a single non-zero divisor. In this case, it's actually principal. And I'm even going to pick a, pick a generator. So for example, uh, if S is a quasi-regular semi-perfectoid over FP, then this is given by the crystalline period ring of S and the ideal is just generated by P. And now you can be brave enough to guess the second part of the statement. If we want to compute the even K groups of our quasi-regular semi-perfectoid ring, we look at this universal prism associated to it and look at the Frobenius eigenspaces no longer for P, but for the corresponding element generating this, this distinguished ideal inside it. So that's the analogous key calculation of the even K groups of a, of a quasi-regular semi-perfectoid. And unfortunately in mixed characteristic, there's a complication that the odd groups don't always vanish. Uh, I think maybe for the sake of time, I'm not gonna write it. Well, I guess I have time to, I guess I can write it down. It's another sort of Art and Schreier style of obstruction. Uh, so namely the following, I've got my prism delta S, I'm gonna define something inside it. And I look at the map Frobenius over D to the J minus one, uh, where this is a certain ideal that we already saw this in the case of A Chris, uh, I think we wanted to define these Nygaard submodules of, of A Chris at a certain moment, it only appeared very briefly by looking at those elements whose image under the Frobenius was sufficiently divisible by P. And we do the same in this case, but P is again just replaced by this distinguished element D inside the ring delta S. So I look at those X's in delta S such that they're imaged by the Frobenius is a multiple of D to the J. And so then on this, I have a well-defined operator Frobenius divided by D to the J, whose kernel, maybe I should explicitly say that. So this is equal to kernel of that map down there. So the, the, the even groups all calculated by the the kernel of this divided Frobenius minus one, these Frobenius uh, divided Frobenius invariants, and the odd K 
k-groups will be calculated by these divided Frobenius co-invariants. And finally, I should mention, uh, should sneak in, uh, this is somewhat parenthetical, but it's, it's important for the formula that I gave for quasi-symptomic cohomology to, to work. We have what's called odd vanishing. Uh, so the K odd vanishes uh, locally on the quasi-symptomic site. Uh, i.e. I can always pick some cover, say S to S prime, where S prime is some other possibly much bigger quasi-regular semi-perfectoid such that all of these odd groups will, will be zero. So we were kind of lucky in characteristic P that the odd groups vanished on the nose for every quasi-regular semi-perfectoid. In mixed characteristic, one is not in quite such a good situation. You might need to pass to some cover. But I mean, since one is using these quasi-regular semi-perfectoids as a basis, uh, passing to some possibly finer cover in the basis is not, a, is not a problem. So I think that's the, that's the, the end of the, the, the big theorem that I wanted to say. So maybe just to, to recap, the point is firstly that associated to some quasi-regular semi-perfector where you have this, this canonically and functorially associated prism. Uh, and so as a prism, it's equipped with, in particular with a Frobenius operator and the, the K groups are computed by the divided Frobenius invariance and, and and co-invariance on this, on this prism. Uh, so in case you're, you're familiar with, maybe more familiar with BMS2 and not prisms, um, I can make the following comment that, so I can complete, let me, I can complete this delta S with respect to the Nygaard filtration. So I take the inverse limit over R of delta S mod n bigger than or equal to, well, let me call it J because it's always going to be J above, n bigger than or equal to J of delta S. In general, this thing will not be complete with respect to, to this filtration, so I, I can always complete it. And then that will actually be the same as, it will be isomorphic to the zero topological periodic cyclic homology group of S. Again, everything should be with piadic coefficients. So that's how this whole story is then related to, to topological cyclic homology. That's, that's, the, that's the, the key identity. Um, and I've only got five minutes left. What more could I tell you about the mixed characteristic story? Ah, we could do an explicit calculation, but there's not been any questions in the chat. Have I? Hasn't anyone appeared? Uh, why don't we now, do, so let's do some explicit calculation of how these things look, how these sorts of delta S's look and what you can actually prove about, about K groups using them. So we'll take, well, to extended example, we'll take o, A to be OC mod P to the M. Well, I've got to tell you what some of these things are. Uh, I don't know what M is. So where C, it's appeared previously, I take uh, the periodic numbers, I algebraically close, and then I periodically complete. So that's our prototypical example of a perfectoid field. And inside it, uh, I take its ring of integers. Uh, but in fact, I'm going to work modulo a power of p, so the completion wasn't even really necessary. So 
So I think we briefly saw A in at some point. Uh, but maybe only very briefly. So Fontaine introduced this ring A inf, which is defined as follows. I take this ring OC, I look at it mod P. So that's a ring containing every element has a P root. In fact, it's a quasi regular semi perfect ring. So every element has a P root, but it's very but very non-uniquely, it contains lots of nilpotents. Uh, I can pass to it inverse limit perfection, which is what you would usually call the tilt of OC. And that gives me a perfect ring of characteristic P. And then I can take its, I can take the ring of width vectors of this perfect ring of characteristic P. And that's the classical period ring A in of Piatikov's theory. And this comes equipped with a map defined by Fontaine that is a surjection back to back to OC uh, with kernel generated by a certain non-zero divisor, which is typically called Xi. Though we might as well call it D because it really is the why don't I just no, no, I call it what it is? Or by certain, generated by certain non zero divisor D. And uh, so A inf and the ideal generated by D uh, is a prism. But now we're going to do the following. I'm going to formally add certain elements to the ideal inside the prism. Uh, okay, so we formally add elements. So what I want to start by doing is adding an element P to the M over D. That's not too problematic, but we want the result to still be a prism. Therefore, I still need to have a Frobenius. And so I have to also add the image of P to the M over D under the Frobenius. But now one needs to be a little bit more careful because prisms, you're not really supposed to equip them with Frobenius lifts, you're supposed to equip them with derived Frobenius lifts, uh, which are really characterized by this delta map structure. And so I should really add, uh, should formally add some image of P to the M divided by D under this delta map. And similarly, delta squared P to the M over D and so on and so forth. And you can universally add these in such a way uh, to get a new prism, A in curly brackets, P to the M over D, again, the ideal will still be generated by D. Um, such that P to the M over D is now, well, it's now in the ideal generated by D. That's kind of tautological from, sorry, P to the M is now in the ideal generated by D. Something like, like P to the M is now in the ideal generated by D. So the general construction would be the following. If you start with some prism, and you start with some sufficiently regular element, which in this case is P to the M, but in general could be some random element T, you can universally force this element into the ideal. And this will turn out to just be an explicit construction of this universal prism associated to OC mod P to the M. In fact, you can see that they both satisfy the same universal property. Uh, so the universal property of the, pris of the delta OC mod P to the M 
this was supposed to be the universal prism, which modulo D receives a map from OC mod P to the M. But that's the same as saying that you construct the universal prism in which you force P to the M into the, into the ideal. And so in that way, you produce a map between these two things. And so repeating our previous calculation, we see that if you want to compute something like the K groups of OC mod P to the M, okay, in there with ZP coefficients, but basically the whole thing is periodic. Ah, no, there's some stuff with these ones. Mm. These will be given by this A in P to the M over D uh, phi equals D to the J eigenspace. And in fact, in this case, there won't be any, any, in this case, there won't even be any odd degree K groups. And this is the sort of calculation which, which underlies, for example, the, a result, I don't that. no, let me not, I think it's not useful to start discussing K1 localizations. Um, I think I just want, to, just want to finish that by saying that the right-hand side is sufficiently uh, explicit to be amenable to, to calculations. So if you want to now compute things like K groups of OC more powers of P, or then you want to try to descend and get information about say K groups of OK mod powers of P, where k is some discretely valued periodic field. So this is an approach. I think I better finish there because I'm a couple of minutes over. So thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Matthew, for a wonderful uh, lecture series. Everybody, an applause for Matthew. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much for hanging on to the end. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe we can have a round of questions and I can start. So you already alluded to connections with TC. Um, maybe you can say a little bit more about that connection? Or? Sure, sure. I mean, historically, that's, of course, how all these things were first constructed. All right, somehow I, 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 okay, so let me scroll back. Ah, oh, I've gone all the way back to the beginning. All the way back to the beginning. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, this is now ancient history from three days ago. Let me go back to... Ah, maybe I can... In fact, I can come in here. So... In fact, this is why I haven't sent the notes yet, because I put all sorts of highlighter marks, which I have to deal with. Um, okay, so this was the definition that we adopted of our... Periodic atomic cohomology, which I like because it's purely internal to K theory in some sense. It, you know, it takes you one page to define the quasi syntonic site. And then, since, since we're all here to study K theory, you already know what the K groups are. And so I can just define it in one line as quasi syntonic cohomology with coefficients in this K theory sheet. But then to actually prove anything about it, we had to fundamentally pass through TC which I, I, I kind of hid, but in fact, so there was this result here that you had to know that a tau K theory was the same as TC. And I guess if you combine it to this one, it tells you that these K groups that we were computing of quasi-regular semi-perfectoids, they were really the topological cyclic homology groups. And so in that sense, you can also reformulate everything in terms of topological cyclic homology, which is how the construction first went in BMS2. And so from this, this prismatic point of view, I can just write the formula down. So let's suppose I've got this quasi-regular semi-perfectoid Oh, well, I've already, I've already alluded to it indeed up here, haven't I? Um, you can define the, you can look at the, the 2J topological periodic cyclic homology group of S. Everything is with periodic coefficients. Um, that's going to be at the end of the sequence. Mm. 
then you've got what's called negative topological cyclic homology of S. And you have a certain cyclotomic Frobenius. Let me kill that J, I don't like it. You have a certain cyclotomic Frobenius between these. You can look at the, <clears throat> then the, the homotopic equalizer of Frobenius and a certain canonical map between them. And that's what calculates for you the true topological cyclic homology of S. And so these topological cyclic homologies, these topological periodic cyclic homologies, these will in fact all coincide with this, this Nygaard completion of this sort of prismatic period ring. Uh, the negative topological cyclic homologies, which in fact sit inside it, they will all look like the induced Nygaard style filtration on it. And then when you pass to the Frobenius invariants, that will identify with, well, it'll be exactly the phi equals D to the J eigenspace inside it. But that term, this topological cyclic homology term will again, by the similar results that I just highlighted in characteristic P, that will be the same as the, as the K group in fact. The trace map will identify K through topological cyclic homology in this term. So this in practice is how you actually do the calculation. I mean, before the prismatic stuff existed, you calculate these topological periodic cyclic homology groups. Um, and then there you can see there's a possible Art and Schreier obstruction term that will calculate TC 2J minus one. And it's that Art and Schreier term that we saw appearing in K 2J minus one. So in that way you can reformulate the entire construction in terms of theory of, of topological cyclic and, and periodic cyclic homology. Thanks a lot. Any other questions? Please go ahead. Can you say something about this computation of K theory of Z mod P to the N? Ah, uh, <laughs> I was afraid someone was going to ask me that. Okay, here's what I convinced myself in the <laughs> during lunchtime oh, yeah. today. During lunchtime today, I mean, I uh, let's try to do the, let's try to do the spectral sequence. Yeah, uh, spectral sequence. Let's take A to B, Z mod P to the M. Let's see if I can. So here's what I think I managed to convince myself of. Some of these bounds are definitely easy. So where are things going to live? So let me adopt the same notation as before for the degree I weight J motivic homology. Um, these will definitely vanish if I is, okay, what do we say? The omega one, but the omega one is generated by zero elements, right? But one is no longer working over FP, one is working over ZP. So there's a certain distinction between some prismatic cohomology and some relative prismatic cohomology that can bump you up an extra generator. So that will tell you that the prismatic cohomology could spread out to degree one. And then the derived Frobenius eigenspaces, they could spread out to degree two, but not any higher. So there won't be anything beyond degree two. Meanwhile, the groups in degree zero, here the same argument that for FPX mod X to the M seems to work. They've got to be P nil potent because the, in fact, the, the, the relative ZP sheaves for, for a nil potent extension will always be PP, P nil potent. Um, and the, but again, the global sections, they're always going to be p torsion free because they're, they're global sections with some p torsion free sheath. So that seems to cover that. So I think I've only got one and two. And now the spectral sequence degenerates. But I'm going to have to draw the spectral sequence to actually get the indexing right. Uh,
So there's my H zero, weight zero. Okay, there might still be that. that that's gonna be a copy of ZP, which is sitting around. That's okay. Uh, then I've got my H one, weight one. That's That one's also okay. That's just Z mod P to the M units. And then I won't pick up anything else on the Milnor line. I don't really need any fancy theory to tell me that. Um, then I start spreading out. So that would be an H1 weight two. And what else am I then supposed to have? I'm supposed to have an H1 weight two. And then here I'm going to have an, ah, sorry, that must be an H. Sorry, there's some problem there. I don't get two H1 weight twos. So I guess there's nothing else there. I know there's the possibility of an H2 weight two. Uh, ah, yes, that's possible. So that's second Milnor K, K group of Z mod P to the M. Yeah, indeed. So the second Milnor K group of, ah, no, that's zero. That's zero. So maybe there's also some way to kill the H2s. But at the, at the moment, I've got them. Uh, and there I put an H2 weight three. There's an H1 weight three. Okay, but that in fact, I, I know is zero. Uh, there's my H2 weight four, H1 weight four. Okay, so that should be enough information now to work out what's going on. Uh, zero, one, two, okay, so K, two J. Ah, wait, wait, wait. No, this is okay, this is okay, this is okay. This is okay. Uh, K to J. In fact, there's no real difference between the tau K theory and, and non tau K theory in this case. Um, so I get my Z mod P to the M and I'm working with the ZP coefficients, but the only effect that has is it kills the, really I'm working with, I'm really I'm computing the relative group, aren't I? Maybe that's a better way to put it. I'm really just computing the relative K group. Sorry, maybe this calculation is very boring for everyone else. Uh, I didn't prepare it enough. So the zero, one, two, oh, that thing seems to vanish. It should be uh, an example class now. Sorry? It should, uh, an example class is running. I get an H2 uh, weight J plus or minus one over two. I can't compute it. And then the odd ones are given by an H1. Exercise for the reader to <laughs> check the indices. Uh, I just need to do a single one. Let's see if we can do K4. Uh, that's zero, one, two, three, four. Is the four coming from the H2? No, it's still, it's just, it's just, it's just 2J, isn't it? Does that make sense? Could it still, could it be the same? No, it must be J plus one. It must be something like J plus one over two. Nothing else would make sense. I think it's J plus one over. I don't know what it is. It's some J plus or minus one expression. I mean, you, you, you can, you can, you can, you can read it off the spectral sequence. I just I mm -hmm. can't do the index. I mean, I can just write it down for you. That's the K zero. That's the K one. Then there's no K two. That's the K three. That's the K four. That's the K5, that's the K6, that's the K7. And now I, I erase my embarrassing attempts to actually work out what the, what the indices were. But I think, that, I, think that's, I think that's right. I didn't think too hard about this, mm. about so, this calculation, but I'm pretty sure you can calculate everything bigger than two and then zero seems to be okay. And yeah, I mean, that seems to calculate the relative K groups for Z1, P to the M relative to. So do you that think you could also read off from this that this vanishes K1 locally? Because I mean, this is, I mean, this, right, I well that's using OC mod to the N. Right, I mean, then what, um, no, I mean, then I what Black, Clarkson and Matthew do is they, is they use these finite flat descent results. Right. or K1 local K theory to get down to, to Z mod P to the N. Mm. So you're asking whether that could be avoided Yes, and instead to just do some—I don't know. The problem is, I—I I, I mean, 
I don't really understand how to compute K1 localization in mixed characteristic if you're not living over OC. I mean, it's, it's mm. not like it's not given by just localizing at some other. Yeah, yeah, it's a more weird operation. But I really have no, I don't have much feel for it actually. Okay, thank so, you. Thanks. No, thanks for the question. I'm glad I prepared that in advance, even though I still missed it. I think that's right. Yeah. Okay, anybody? Other questions? Yeah, just a quick question. Where uh, can I read the result about uh, comparing uh, cyclic uh, <laughs> with uh, K in coefficient? Uh, coefficients in ZP, just a... uh, so that's in my paper with Clausen and Matthew on Hensilian ideals. So the 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 point is the following. Um, let me do the characteristic P case. So in fact, in the characteristic P case, then you just need to check that if A is a strictly Hanselian local, but, but it just comes down to the, it comes down to the following assertion: it doesn't really need to be an FP algebra. We take a strictly Hanselian local ring of characteristic P, and in that case, you want to show that the Connective K theory with ZP coefficients is the same as the topological cyclic homology. I hope I haven't made some TC minus one issue. No, I don't think there'll be any TC minus one. So that's what one wants to prove. So that's, that's. In characteristic P, the assertion really follows from that. In, in mixed characteristic, there's a little extra step because. Uh, of course, if you have a general mixed characteristic ring and you look at the etal site, then there will also be strictly Hensilian local rings of residue characteristic zero. But in fact, you can ignore these by Gabba's affine analog of the proper base change theorem. So we just need to prove this assertion for strictly Hensilian local rings of characteristic P. And the main theorem in CMM is that if you compare this to what's going on at the level of the residue field, you get a homotopy Cartesian square because the maximal ideal is Hensilian. And so that reduces you to checking the same thing for the bottom arrow. Uh, and that's an equivalence by uh, wait, I'm strict. Okay, I'm separately closed. So I then just calculate both sides. Uh, so Geiser Levine tells me how the K groups look on the left because it's just a field of characteristic P. And Geiser Hesselholt calculates the groups on the right. And on both sides, they're just given by like omega log forms. And so they match up there, and then by the rigidity result, you also get that equivalence upstairs. But you you need the full force of this rigidity result to get that, as far as I can as far as I can tell. And as I mentioned at some other point, uh, I mean this is like one of the moments that the Geiser Levine's classical work on on like called classical is only twenty years old. K groups on periodic K groups of characteristic P fields appears. I mean, uh, like I, I'd love to have some some new approach to that phrased in terms of all this technology, but that that seems very difficult. It's really used as an input in in, in all these developments. Sorry, are you able uh, to recover this theorem? Or no, 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 not at all. I mean, it's used like right from the right from the very beginning, right from the very beginning of all the machinery. It it, it starts being used. No, I mean I don't see I don't see any way to access. No, I don't see any way to access the 
chaotic gay groups without without using this. I mean, in some sense, everything is just very, 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 very fancy reduction. You ultimately, need need this input. Um, can, can I have a question? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Who, who, who's who's there? I don't see you. Ah, yeah. I worked it out. Yeah. Yeah, and so I was wondering, uh, I mean, you, so the, the periodic uh, motility complex is now, so you defined it for like every ring now, yeah, or, or every periodic ring at least by, by the can extend here. And so when it's, when it's uh, smooth over on FP algebra, then it's, uh, I mean, Geiser Levine again, which tells you that it's a log scheme. Uh, I mean, a lock, um, sorry, lock forms. Right, right, sure. Yeah. And, uh, but now what, when you have a smooth, um, a smooth ring over Z mod P square, say. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you say then what it is? Uh, or I mean, or does it sit in an, you know, is it an extension or do you have a triangle where, where it sits in? Okay, so a, comparing a, a, it with the lock forms? Or? No, I mean, it's not going to be as simple as log forms. I mean, if you, if you, if you, I know, definitely not. <laughs> but no, uh, I, mean, I would like to understand because I don't see it at all. What, what it could no. be. No, so over Z mod, over some fixed Z mod P to the M, I don't know. So if you're, let's say, let's, let me start with an easier question. If you're periodically smooth over ZP, so if mm -hmm. you're formally smooth over ZP, let's say, mm -hmm. so I take some smooth algebra over ZP and I periodically complete it. Mm -hmm. In this case, I mean, apart from this periodic completion issue, uh, one already has a candidate for periodic motivic cohomology. In fact, you could, you could just take block cycle complex, which Levine studied on smooth things over DVRs. Yeah. And in this context of, of, say, something smooth over ZP, where you then periodically complete it, that's known to be the same as this construction study by Schneider and Sato. You, mm. you just look at the, at the homotopy fiber of Cato's residue map from truncated periodic nearby cycles down to the log down to the omega log forms on the on the special fiber. Mm. Uh, okay. And it's so in that case we have a comparison between this new general theory and that mm -hmm. sort of explicit Sato Schneider theory. But that's really when you're over ZP. Now yeah. indeed you can you can go back to your question and say what about something smooth over Z mod P squared? Can one write down a description on the nose and uh, or is there some I, base change uh, property of theorem? Or? I mean, of periodic motivic cohomology. No. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's there's, there's however there's a continuity theorem. So if you if you want to study the so the the motivic cohomology for this formally smooth thing over ZP will be the inverse limit of all the theories over the Z mod P to the M's. Yeah. I'm saying that's not a very, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. can you can recover the theory over ZP from the from the mm -hmm. base change of the theory of all the Z mod P to the M's. But then you can indeed ask you a more precise question, which is a perfectly good question. What if I really fix some Z mod P to the M and I study smooth things over? Mm -hmm. And I don't. Uh, no, I don't. I mean, I don't have a description mm -hmm. of it. Okay. No, no, it's a. I don't know. Okay. Okay, if you want to jump in I'm with another question, now's the time. I think I'm going to jump in with a correction that I'm no longer convinced that the H zeros in this uh, spectral sequence is zero. So maybe one should re add some H. Whoops. Maybe I need to come back and add some, some H zeros. And then I would get some extension terms describing the, the even K groups. So I need to think about that. I need to think yeah. about that. Happy? Yeah. Ah, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. No, no, it's okay. I, I, I retract my retraction. Retract my retraction. I can't promise I won't change my mind again. Sorry, there was another question. Yeah, uh, so completely different. So in the first talk, you, you, you talked about Selma K theory that somehow the I think you thought of it as a better version of the tau uh, K theory. Can you sort of assemble these spectral sequences to get spectral sequence for Selma K theory? Well, I mean, that's, that's, people are thinking about that. 
the so for the periodic story, I think I mentioned last time that I mean, once you periodically complete the rings and the cohomology theories, it's our K theory is the same as Selma K theory. So then you want to try to glue the Atal cohomologies, the periodic Atal cohomologies, and use some standard arithmetic fracture square arguments to just glue everything together. And in principle, that's possible. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, I know that it's, uh, uh, I know that Bart, Clausen, and Matthew were thinking about this and have some results in this direction. But I mean, really, the, the that's the real beauty of Salma Kater, actually, that it, it, it lets you glue all these local constructions in a way in which these more naive approaches to a, to a tau K theory wouldn't let you do. Uh, so maybe apart from some complications, I don't know how many complications are going to be rationally. I mean, it should output some general theory of integral. It, uh, no, I'm really a bit concerned about that. There's something to do in the, for the rational theory, I think. There's something to do for the rational theory. Um, but the, the, this is certainly the direction things are going together. Slightly vague answer. Okay, great. I think we should uh, thank Matthew again for a wonderful lecture series. No, no, thank you. Summary seminar is next week, right? Thursday next week. So you're welcome back then. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>